I'd like to thank you all for this opportunity to be here. I'll sing um, a song that is from my clan, from my family, and uh, that I learned with uh, my grandfather. Uh, it's a ceremonial song. First of all, for the rivers, because in our nation we know that life began in the water, and so we sing to the waters all the time, and then to the forests. The forest in our language is yoku. And uh, so this is um, is giving thanks to the Great Spirit for all this beautiful creation that we are the sons and daughters of. Uh, we arrive in new places and I just came from Paris but before I was in Brazil far away from here and we use this song to compliment to when we arrive in new places 
And for me, it's been really strange because it's a song for the forest and I miss it so much. We live in the largest forest in the world, the Amazon rainforest. And now we have reached 20% of deforestation of this Amazon. And when we reach 25% of deforestation, it will desertify. It won't last forever. The indigenous territories protect 22% of biodiversity in the world. We concentrate this life because we think and we relate differently with this life everywhere. And we are wa walking all over the world to share all this love for nature. And I am really, really happy and really, 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 really happy to be here and meet new people that really work for that because we feel the same thing, what is important. So sharing this song is not just art, it's not just a song, it's sharing the spirit of the forest. And I'm really glad to share it with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I, I had not heard of Tree Sisters before, but I thought the very name was uh, an alluring uh, and, and definite urge to uh, participate. Uh, I should, my own qualifications are limited, except that most extraordinarily, uh, I had a, a great friend who was a, an extremely rich man. Um, I don't have many rich friends, but he, he happened to be accidentally rich, as far as I could tell. But anyway, he was a publisher. He published computer magazines when computers were invented. His name was Felix Dennis, and he was also a poet. And on his deathbed, he, um, he called me up and he said, I haven't got any living relatives. I thought, God, my ship is in. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, uh, I haven't any living relatives, but I'm going to leave all my money to the planting of a 30,000-acre forest north of Stratford-on-Avon. I wanted to be called the Heart of England Forest. And so far we've planted, he said, I want you to be the chair, and we've planted eight and a half thousand acres, which is nothing by comparison with what Claire does at every waking moment of the day. But at, at any rate, we are planting English broadleaf trees. Uh, the, the difficulty at the moment is Brexit, because Brexit is holding up land sales. It's very difficult to buy land. A lot of farmers want to get out of land up there. It's a perfect place to do it. Um, and uh, well, we're going to deliver. Uh, we have three patches of land, big patches of forest. Um, of course, if you visit, it tends to be a lot of plastic, but you know what that is. That's all about resisting the, the, uh, the squirrels. Um, but, but we've also matured trees as well. But anyway, there we are now, having said that and justified my being here at all. Here, <laughs> here is Claire Dubois. Give oh, her a good welcome. Good grief. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and we're standing up to put you at ease because if we sit down uh, you won't see us and I always think you need to see the person who's talking to you if at all possible unless you're on the telephone. Um, so Claire, Tree Sisters, go for it. Before I do, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, you know, the fact that you can read the news and then miraculously appear is extraordinary. Thank the bicycle. Thank the bicycle. <laughs> thank the bicycle. Um, I want to thank you all. This, this is... Uh, and not a minor miracle for me, to be perfectly honest with you, that you're all here. And uh, Howard, for it wasn't a crazy idea, for the brilliant idea of doing this. Yeah. And for everybody that I know has been sending out the invites and reaching out, and to my team as well, who've done so much to help this happen, and to the Conduit Club. We think we know why we're here. I always like to hand it over to the mystery because this happening, these minutes that we have together, have never happened before and will never happen again, ever. And so there is a completely unique constellation here. And that brings all the ingredients of your brilliance, of your audacity, of your complete uniqueness, which creates a particular recipe that is a one-time recipe. And we don't know what 
this beingness actually has in terms of its potential at all. Now, I have a roaring agenda, and I will own it, and that is to seed each one of you into the heart of Tree Sisters somewhere so that between us we can take this to scale because it needs to go to scale. And not just Tree Sisters, anything that is to do with restoring our planet needs to go to scale, and needs to go to scale really fast. But before you do, I want to ask you about what you said at the beginning of the whole session. Which was? Well, what was said about you, that you were planting how many it's thousand? It's not me. No, but I mean you. <laughs> Look, we are, all, we are all you and we are all we. We, we meaning a lot of um, indigenous peoples, a lot of uh, men and women, a lot of women actually across Cameroon and Nepal and Brazil, North and South India, Madagascar, uh, and Madagascar. where else have I forgotten? Oh. Two major projects in Madagascar. Um, Madagascar needs trees, my God. Madagascar needs trees extremely Tree, well. Trees ravaged, a uh, place that had trees yeah. and, and then had them taken away. But actually where we're planting in Brazil, we've got 3% left of what was the Atlantic rainforest. Where we're planting in Nepal, we've got between 3 and 7% left of what was the Japa um, forest. Where we're planting in Kenya, the forest is gone on the north slopes of Mount Kenya. And what people don't seem to understand about trees, apart from almost anything, is that there are rain creators. If you have a forested continent, the updraft of the transpiration and the water that they actually create through the heating, especially in the tropics, pulls in water from the oceans. So they don't just create rain by seeding it and transpiring it, they also bring the moisture that is required from the oceans. When you deforest, you're actually, the oceans pull the water back off the land. So because of deforestation, we've lost 50% of our rain already on this planet and we're heating. So um, why the tropics for us is a multifaceted thing. First, when I had the car crash in which Tree Sisters was given to me, they said, you have to reforest the tropics within 10 years. That was before I fully understood why Gaia in her absolute brilliance had arranged ice at her caps to cool and then fast growing tropical trees around her waist where it's the hottest so that she could use that heat to create the cooling and the rainfall that then the pressure difference between the hot and the cold allows the hydrological cycle that actually makes our world livable, makes our world fertile, that basically moves rain around the place. And, and so for me, when we're talking about trees, we're not just talking about climate change. Of course we want fast growing tropical trees, forests, actually forests everywhere. We need all of them to get our carbon out of the atmosphere, but it's more than carbon. It's rainfall in a huge way. And it's it's hydrological balancing, it's meteorological balancing. They are the great stabilizers. We can't lose them, simply said. But you're talking about currently planting huge numbers of trees. We're planting over two million a year across eight ecosystems in six tropical countries. Here's me boasting of 8,000 acres in... Boast. It's a lot more expensive in England than it is in Madagascar. Sure is. <laughs> um, you know, and our projects have very different price points and our cheapest trees are 10 cents. These are mangroves in Madagascar. Why? Because you don't need nurseries. You don't, you know, and they grow like bilio. In this particular place, you take a seed, you stick it in the ground, it grows, and by the next year, it's producing more seeds. They call it a 250% growth rate. But um, across all our projects, where our most expensive in southern India, you can't grow a tree without drip irrigation because the monsoons have failed and industrial agriculture has sucked the groundwater dry. Trees cannot put their roots down and find anything. The rivers are drying up, nine rivers already gone. And so when you average out everything, we come at a much lower cost than you'll ever find growing trees in the UK. But the wonderful thing about tropical trees is there are some species that will be my height the first year you plant them. Whereas in England, it's like your oak is this big and it's wonderful, but a fast growing forest that has a, a year long growing season. You know, tropical trees sequester carbon three times as fast as temperate. Because of that fact, they don't rest in the winter. Therefore, there is great purpose. But more than that, it is because we cannot lose that belt, not just for cooling, but for biodiversity. And almost especially for the indigenous knowledge that is essential if humanity is gonna make the shift out of this dominant state that we're in back into reverence with the natural world. But you're talking massive uh, numbers of people involved, and that takes organization. It takes organization, which is not in what so I do. In so many different places. Yes. But the trick to trying to do anything like this is to find people that know what they're doing. So um, we 
have a very rigorous process of assessing potential partners, and especially partners who are specialists in the countries that they work in, who really know how to work, and especially those that honor and work with the local people and help the local people take ownership over the project. It's absolutely essential that it's not just, you know, I won't do drones, like everything was like, oh, let's use technology to solve this. The technology that is needed is love. The technology that is needed is the human heart back in relationship with the natural world to the extent that we cannot destroy it anymore. And the fundamental relationship is between human and trees. And so we very specifically look at projects that are helping people understand all the different ways that they can both restore ecosystems through the trees themselves, but restore their own livelihoods through the trees, restore their dignity, get out of malnutrition. In Madagascar, we're getting people out of slavery. We didn't even know that was happening. But because Madagascar is raped, because they've taken the highland forest and they've taken the lowland forest and they've taken the mangroves and the mountains just bleed into the sea, that soil doesn't just strip the land, but it also disrupts the coral. And so whilst we've got climate change disrupting coral, we've also got soil erosion disrupting coral and the fish stocks disappear. And so the people of Madagascar around the coasts who require fish in order to live, but also require fish yields in order to be able to pay the what they call the fish barons who have boats and nets for them to be able to loan. If they go out and they come back without a yield, then they're in endangered slavery to those people. And essentially that means you can't work anywhere else, you can't earn, if you can't feed your children, they die. Or you give your women away. So helping these coastal villages become reforesters is a massive social state. Well, well let's take Madagascar, because that's a good, very good example. I mean, it's been troubled by much more even than you've mentioned. I mean, I think it was South Korea bought up huge amounts of acreage and planted things which were not natural to the local environment, and they lost a lot of trees. And uh, I wonder where you start. I mean, who did you find first? Where? We found um, Eden Projects, who actually were originally religious uh, and humanitarian, and who went to Madagascar because they were looking at poverty alleviation. And so they were working with how do we basically get these people out of extreme poverty. And the win-win-win is help them get out of poverty by doing something that actually then creates a virtuous circle, in which case bring back the mangrove forests, which essentially stops all the uh, erosion pouring off into the ocean, which then protects the coral. The mangroves are the fishing that produce the fishing grounds. The only things you have to worry about um, baby mangroves is whether the crabs walk off with them, <laughs> which is better in other countries. Um, but they're bringing back the fish yield. So you've got the people getting out of poverty because we're paying them a wage to become reforesters. Their wage brings them, you know, they can feed their children, they can get their children back into school, they can do health care, and they're protecting the, 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 the land. The we arrive the at, we. in Madagascar, your we arrive, and you find a village chieftain, a, a farmer? I mean, where, Steve where do you from start? Eden Projects arrives right. in Madagascar, okay. and Steve is a dude who has lived all over the world and is not frightened by cultures that I would basically completely flounder in. And he knows how to work with them. So this, they go into the villages and they start talking to the villagers, and yes, they would talk to the village chiefs, and they start looking at community land and community land ownership, and then what they could do for them, and then who there could be trained to take positions of authority inside of that And tree movement. sisters? And Tree Sisters, we primarily exist to raise awareness, to plant seeds in the heart and minds of the masses, but also to uh, normalize reciprocity with nature. So our role is basically to say, if we're warming our world, we have to cool it. If we're getting in a car, if we're flicking on a switch, if we're eating food that's been flown, we're warming our world, every single one of us. Climate change is coming, it's like it's here now. I mean, we're in it. You know, everyone's still saying, when the tipping points, they've all tipped. You know, the reality is it's not just the 11th hour, we've probably gone past 12. And so there is a fundamental responsibility that each of us have to this world that has given us everything. It's given us everything we need, everything we want, the bodies we have, the bodies of all the people that we love, our homes, you name it. There's nothing that we have that hasn't been taken. And yet what do we give back? because we live in a culture that has normalized dominance over nature to such a degree that our convenience has made any future for today's children a complete inconvenience, or actually possibly an impossibility. So for us, it's not about scare tactics, it's about generating uh, uh, an emotional connection back to mother, 
back to the one that is giving us everything. Sort of taking, seeing if we can, you know, we're very experimental. How do you remove the veil that has us in this trance of normalized dominance? And then how do we reach through and say, okay, one gesture is that every single one of us could actually be giving back to uh, balance off our, our warming with cooling. You know, if you know, fi I thought it would be so easy. This is the thing. I thought, oh my God, trees, of course, fast growing tropical trees. If we have this many million of us just giving like this, that's a, that's a tsunami of giving. Then we just have to find the infrastructure and we can just plant the trees. And whilst we're figuring out how to wean ourselves off a carbon economy, we can be regreening everything in sight and basically giving ourselves a chance. But actually, it's been really, really difficult because collective consciousness is rooted in consumption. We're, we're called consumers. We're not called restorers, we're not even called citizens anymore. We're labeled by the act of taking, which is, which is fundamentally remarkably disrespectful to the brilliance and the love and the capacity for care makes me want to weep. I probably cry during this, so just bear with me, just cry with me. Um, that, that we are. And so, you know, why women inside of Tree Sisters? Is that because I'm disqualifying men? Absolutely not. But we have a profound lack of feminine leadership in this world. And when I say feminine leadership, I'm not saying women dressed up as men, trying to match the men, trying to outmen the men. I'm talking about women who are connected enough to what we actually are, which is not what we've been taught at all, as aspects of nature who have the womb, you know, the moon in our wombs that actually have cyclical natures that understand the cycles of life and death because it happens in us consistently, who can bring through a different consciousness and who are oriented to relationship. It's relationship that is missing. It's the heart that is missing. We've turned our relationship with this planet into something of a commodity as if somehow if we trash the whole thing just to make money, we're going to survive and we're not. So we essentially are, I hate this language, but it's what comes out of my mouth, like raising an army of love, you know, love in action on behalf of nature, helping women to remember that we're not what we've been taught and to start feeling our way towards solutions that aren't coming from here, but that are coming from here, because this is made of the natural world. The natural world doesn't waste a damn thing. She is infinitely brilliant, and all of her brilliance is inside of us. So if we can get out of this or start to match it with this or this, there's a chance that we can start to bring through a different quality of leadership that could create new solutions. That, that shift the paradigm. We've got, as far as I'm concerned, five years to shift the paradigm. And it's a big shift, but it's already happening. And it's so interesting that we've got Extinction Rebellion out there saying, tell the truth. You know, tell the truth. Why aren't our governments telling the truth? Why aren't they giving us the chance to rise up and discover what we're actually capable of if we take this seriously? I'm actually quite intrigued, having just had to push my bicycle around, uh, uh, how, how annoyed people are Yes. with them without actually thinking what it's all about. They um, are, Extinction Rebellion are standing for every single one of us in this room. Mm. They're standing, I'm going to cry, here we go. They're standing for every child. You know, I woke up a few weeks ago mm. and I thought, there's not a single child that is going to be born now that will ever have what any of us had. Mm. It's gone. And Extinction Rebellion are trying to say, can we actually just, can we do something about that, please? And everyone's going, get out of my way. I want to carry on with business as normal. Business as normal is over. I think, I mean, some of us here, certainly speaking for myself, will be, feel to be somewhat linear. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, kind of uh, plugged into and, and still utilizing the world that is destroying the world. Yeah. And therefore, what I'm trying to reach out to you for is what is the route from what you believe you are doing to link in with the people who are still defoliating the world? Defoliating, there's a word. That's a really intelligent question. Give me a moment to formulate a thought. Well, the thing is, I feel a long way from Madagascar. Yeah. Seriously, I'm, I'm, I, I can see, I have been there, and so I, I, I know what you're talking about, but I, I'm not sure what I have to do to help Madagascar uh, with Tree Sisters? 
Well, I mean, essentially... At That's the a rather linear question. I'm yeah, saying. but it's a great question. And at the most basic level, what we're doing is we're gathering funds from every single person and we're sending it to the tropics. You know, if everyone in this room gave as much as they could give every month, not just the least to feel good, but the most, because it matters, you know, how many millions of trees, more trees could we be planting? You know, when... Um, if I think about the scale of the industries that exist, so for instance, the health and wellness and beauty industry, 3.7 trillion. Every, every industry in the world basically is acting as if you can take and money can be made out of extracting whatever from the earth. Now, what if, that in, what, if, what if we decided collectively as part of the paradigm shift that we are going to have to create ourselves, everyone in this room, to embed restoration inside of every financial transaction? What if you can't take from the planet anymore without giving back? What if that becomes the new normal? The new normal that we're trying to create inside of Tree Sisters is dynamic reciprocity. You don't take without giving back. You don't heat without cooling. Basic level of responsibility. So It's rather interesting that the industries that you mentioned are the ones that have stepped forward and given the nigh on 1 billion uh, euros to restore Notre Dame. But if we had asked them for... Uh, uh, that money to restore the rainforest, we, they would have said, well, very nice meeting you. The issue is, <laughs> I know, I, I, I listened and they were like, oh, this family is going to give 100 million. I'm like, 100 million? How many trees could we plant? What could we actually do? But the point is, and this is actually what makes Tree Sisters unique. Yes, there's planting trees. Absolutely. Yes, there's waking people up. The fundamental issue is consciousness shift yeah. and that's the thing that I haven't found another environmental organization trying to tackle in the way that we're tackling you know Tree Sisters sits at the confluence of gender climate change restoration behavior change and consciousness shift that's like a magic mm -hmm. fivesome there like our absolute core things <sighs> Paul Hawkin got behind us the guy who did project drawdown 100 greatest solutions to climate change he rang me up one day and said do you realize you've got the ultimate solution and uh, because he'd been doing the numbers and women and trees came up so much in the top 10 of the 100 solutions to climate change, when you put them together, they came out number one. And I was like, wow, that's amazing that people are cottoning on to this. But he said, actually, the biggest thing, the biggest solution is, is a consciousness shift. And I was like, yeah, and we're doing that as well. So this state that we're in, this normalized state of dominance, it's just, I mean, that's, that's what you mean. It's, you, you call it linear. It is linear. It's like we can plough over life and expect life to just keep going without actually considering the fact that the life that we're ploughing over is producing everything that we need, including our weather patterns. But the reality is that inside each of us, because we are the earth, is a different truth that is accessible. You've just got to figure out how to hit it. It's like being a tuning fork, enough of a tuning fork to the integrity of a human being or the authenticity of a human being, you know, being that thing, like creating a, a sound or, a, or an impulse or a frequency that holds such a level of truth that is kind of permission to come home to yourself. I do not believe the world is thriving in the guise of the world consumer. I do not believe that how we are existing as human beings is, is creating happiness. Actually, what it's doing is creating more mental illness than ever before, more cancer, more disease, more distress, more dysfunction. Why? Because we're getting further and further away from who we actually are. So the path has to be, how do we start like that journey back to who and what we really are? And that invitation, if it sounded, you know, our experiment is, do we want to shift collectively from a consumer species to a restorer species? Can we find the languaging that goes ping inside a human heart and they go, oh, I've got to be part of the solution. I can't carry on. You know, that's what Extinction Rebellion are trying to do. They're trying to like bang a gong so loud that enough people go, you know what, I need to be part of the solution. And then as soon as you've made that shift and there's, a, there's like an opening, there's a curiosity, not just to what needs to be done, but what is in here that might be wanting to come out, you know, what is unlived in each of us? To me, climate change offers us the most astonishing opportunity to discover what we're made of. Like there's, there's no excuse anymore to sit on our gifts or our generosity or our brilliance or our radical behavior. It's time for radical. Really, we, we get to just go, I've never known what I'm doing. 
I haven't, I've started this thing without a clue, but it needed to be done. You know, we're about to see if we can start a, a major collaboration around Year of the Tree in 2020, and then see if we can map out a whole 10-year plan. Do I know how to do that? No, we're going to find the people that do. We're going to get people in a room and we're going to sit in collective consciousness and honor the fact that our collective brilliance has to be the thing that brings us through. And if you have an idea, it's time for it. And if you haven't got the guts to do it, find somebody who'll hold your hand because they'll believe in you. And that has to be the way forward. Like one person with another person and another person daring to step up and say, first of all, I don't know what to do. What can I do? This is what is in me to give. Show me how to give it and let the world steer you to your brilliance. Right. Well, let's draw on the collective brilliance. OK. And from the collective brilliance, get the questions that may steer us. I think we'll sit down now. Because Only questions that make us both sound really intelligent. Please. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and uh, so let's see if anybody wants to try and penetrate the collective brilliance that is assembled here in Clare. Uh, would anybody like to? Yes, in the middle there. It, it is a very, <laughs> it, it, it's a very interesting thing that the chiming of things that are happening. We've emerged, most of us in this room who live in Britain, f from the most appalling period in which people have been beastly to each other on a scale we haven't seen really since the 30s. Um, and, and suddenly you get something like Notre Dame or whatever, and people say, my God, we must treasure these things. And then you raise the whole question as uh, the demonstrators outside are raising, right at the right moment, raising the questions of what is this world about? You know, is it really about how we trade with Europe or is it actually about how we're going to save the planet? Yeah, and what do you do potentially if the Gulf Stream comes to an end? Do you split off from Europe or do you hang on to each other for dear life? You know, are we going to distract ourselves endlessly or are we actually going to start preparing for a different climate because it's coming? You know, the Greenland ice sheet is melting at such a rate that the freezing cold water that's pouring into the northern Atlantic is now completely disrupting the oceanic currents. We can't go on and think that there isn't going to be massive change and nobody's looking at it. And I do think it has to be grassroots, which is why I'm right behind Extinction Rebellion. I'll be on a bridge tomorrow, you know, because I feel in integrity with myself, even if I'm pissing off a whole load of people who just want to carry on as normal, you know, what we need to actually do is be in integrity with our values and everything that matters to us. You know, the New York Declaration on Forests in 2014 came out and said we need to halve deforestation by 2020. We need to end the deforestation of old growth forests by 2030. What followed from there was an increase of 46% in deforestation for the following three years. 2017 was the worst year of deforestation since 2001. Emissions from, from the forests have gone up 68%. We're not just going in the wrong direction. We're storming in the wrong direction. But here we are. Here we are. This is the situation that we find ourselves in. We can either be completely awake to it, let it have us. And if you don't cry, basically, I don't think you're breathing. If you can let it have you, if you can let your heart break, if you can take it seriously, you will be changed because the nature in you will step up and show you who you are and what you're for. And then why you do have the influence that you have, or you have the money that you have, or you have the connections that you have, or you have the positions that you have, that can actually do something if you're no longer prepared to every time somebody goes, oh, don't talk about that, say, well, actually, I'm not going to stop talking about it. 
because I have to be in integrity with myself. And when my children or my grandchildren look at me and say, what did you do when you knew this was coming and you knew you were selling us down the Swanee, you can turn around and say, I did everything. I can do that. And I know there are a lot of people in this room that can say it. I do everything, every waking breath, because it matters. Because I can't bear every day on the news reading another species is gone. I can't bear just going along going, oh, wow, 70% of the insects have collapsed. Oh, look, we're not going to be able to pollinate our food. Oh, wow, the storms are getting worse. We have storms now that lift sharks out of the sea and slam them through garden fences in the Caribbean. Storms strong enough not just to knock down trees, but to rip the bark off. And we can't just sit there and go, oh, look, more news, so we flick it over. It's a massive, massive opportunity. And here we are. This is it. This is where we're at. And so on some level, there has to be some perfection, even though it feels terrifying. Because the whole trajectory of our human evolution has brought us to here. And that has included patriarchy. And patriarchy cannot sustain life. It's designed to repress the feminine principle. It's designed to suppress life, which is why less than 3% of global giving goes to women and the environment, the life givers of, this, of everything. Less than 2% of financing, global financing goes to reforestation. 40 times that much goes to subsidizing mining and infrastructure development and everything that is going to destroy our forests. We think technology is going to save us. The majority of the precious metals that we require for this smart future are underneath the last intact remaining forests on our planet. This can't happen. What could we do? What could we do collectively if every single person in this room said, this is not going to happen on my watch? What could we do? We could astonish ourselves, but we've got to get loud and a bit outrageous and not care about what people think, which is actually really rather freeing, I have to say. You get to wear pink socks. <laughs> yes, in the middle of the table. So, um, I'm, I'm Stephen Dunbar Johnson from the New York Times. I, um, do, by the way, the, the, the Pino family, one of the people that donated 100 million, 100 million. yesterday, um, he, they're actually, their sustainable development program at Caring is, is fairly... It's fairly advanced, certainly in, in terms of most people in the, in the uh, luxury consumer industry. If we're going to get people rightly to move from consumers to, to restorers, restorers, is it not going to be very effective or effic more efficient to speak to the likes of Pino or the CEO of, of Shell, who actually is a, is a tree obsessive as well, to get those people to integrate the whole message of res restoration in their packaging, in their marketing. So when you're buying a product, you are also buying a tree. Yes, when, that's when one of my... When you're filling up your tank yeah. uh, it, at a Shell station, you are buying a tree. Um, is that not part, a significant part of the solution? Yes, it's a very significant part of the solution. Uh, if I leave Shell out of it just for one second. Now I know... I know that they are doing a lot, and I know that they came out and they said that we needed to plant a lot of trees, which is phenomenal. And they're still determined to keep the fossil fuel industry going, and they are the root of a large amount of destruction. And I am the head of a global network of women, and if I even looked at Shell, I would lose them. So much as there is a, a real call... Sorry, why, why would you... Because they consider tree sisters so pure at heart, and even if we were supporting Shell, they would see that we were, we were condoning Shell. So as a being, this being here, I want to personally live an inclusive existence that basically says, okay, every gesture towards doing some good, planting trees inside of any organization is like an opening in the door. The trees themselves will help the consciousness shift that that organization will try to steer as the head of a women's reforestation organization that has extremely uh, pure values, I can't do it with everybody. So we're going to be able to work with some and we're not going to be able to work with others. Do I want to embed restoration inside every financial transaction? Yes. I see that as like a bridge between, uh, as consumerism changes, as we denormalize the kind of convenience consumerizing, cons consumerizing, it's a new word, um, consumption that we're in the, we've normalized, as we transition over to a culture that no longer will consume anything without thought for the consequences on future generations, which is where we have to go if we're going to survive. We have to start thinking long term 
health and viability of everything in the way that the native people of this planet always have, or we won't make it. So the bridge for me is both weaning ourselves off fossil fuels, like really figuring out, weaning ourselves off mindless consumption, waking up to every choice that we make that we are funding Whatever it is that we pay for, we are funding, we're accepting whatever that is. Yes, embedding restoration to every financial transaction, then figuring out whether we need those financial transactions, then completely uh, redefining ourselves. You know, we get to redefine ourselves. We get to ask some really deep questions about what a human being is for, what the human species is for. We apparently have the DNA of every living species in our DNA, they call it junk DNA. I see that as potentially access to the intelligence of every living thing on this planet encoded in us. Are we the superior species? No superior species trashes life for all of everything else. Perhaps the superior species or the <coughs> species has the capacity to bow in humility before the magnificence of the natural world and learn how to be in relationship with it. And maybe we have to almost lose everything in order to figure out the essential sacred value of every living thing and then turn ourselves into the protectors and restorers of those things. But there's something very important, I think, in, in what you raised, and that is the question whether you permit allies. Yes. And you see, for example, today there's a big piece in, in, in the news about bowel cancer and eating red meat. Extremely bad for you. Uh, far, far higher instances of bowel cancer. With red, well, heavens, we've wanted to get rid of red meat for years, because red meat farts, uh, you know, putting it crudely. I mean, that's cows, that's beef, that's methane. Um, and that's methane, and, and that, that's one of the most destructive things. So can we be as purist as you are being, or should we be beginning to branch out and embrace? I'm not being purist. I'm not being purist. I don't think just saying right now we can't work with Shell because it would cause too much pandemonium. And we're not, as a, a tree says, we're not big enough and robust enough to be able to, to handle the backlash. but. I want to work with, I want to help business leaders in any industry I can get my hands on recognize that their customer base is an ecosystem of effective change waiting to be invited to change. I want trees embedded in every product, beauty products, health products, you know, uh, you computing. No, I, I, I'm sorry, Ray Shell, I think it's a bit of a distraction. The main point no, but the point is, yes. How to get, for want of a better word, leaders to, to embed this whole philosophy in, their, in the way that they, they talk to their consumers. Because I think there are businesses now that are acutely aware that restorers, let's call them restorers, are, want, are wanting to restore, are craving to restore. Yeah. But you've got to find a way of allowing them to do so. Yes. I think there is, there, there is a wholesale feeling out there and it's manifesting itself literally in the streets now but I think your average person is becoming much more aware of these issues now and wants to do something yes and I think people whose businesses are driven through consumption which is most businesses need to connect with their future restorers yes and so it, it's about how to help leaders lead it's an invitation I mean to me it's, it's the right invitation and that's what, we're, that's what we're in the process of crafting right now. And I do think that the actual, um, the desire on the consumer's part to want to work with values-based organizations, to want to consume through values-based organizations, will drive the markets. And that's another reason why women, because we're 85% of the consumer market. And so when women decide that they're going to only work with those that are giving back, we'll see a swing. We only have five minutes really of this left. So what I want to do is to take a cascade of questions ah. and then you wrap up, right? How's okay. that? All right. Yeah. Let's, let's begin with the, the two here. Yeah. Yes. Isn't part of the solution also talking about the, the short-term benefits and immediate solutions? Because you talked about the effect on mental health and incidents on disease, etc. So, you know, people think that the solutions are worse than the long-term consequences. What if we tell them that the solutions are going to benefit them in the immediate? And I think there was an OECD study recently that, that showed that for every dollar spent on greening cities, it was between five and ten dollars reaped in increased health and welfare and productivity. So maybe we should, you know, there's not enough generosity to think about future generations. Why don't we talk more about the benefits right now? The benefits of the now. Let, let's keep that as the first one. The, just the next one, and then I'll come back to you. Questions down, please. Can you hmm? write answers down? All right. 
Sorry, I'm just asking. My uh, can't hold the question. Uh, in the green. Um, I was the most apt colour to be wearing uh, today. So, um, do you think investors can help with this by demanding we only invest in, or it's, so that we demand of the companies we want to invest in that they have thought about where the supply, where their supply chains come from, and their impact on forests? Very good question. Yeah. Can you hold these in your head? I've got them all in my head. <laughs> and, and, and two, two more, although we seem to be favouring the left for some reason. Yeah. And the, um, the general public is very aware of the issue of plastic. Yeah. Because of Dave Attenborough, whatever. How about in, when people gather up 10 plastic bottles, instead of getting a pound coin back, we actually plant tree. 10 trees in Madagascar? Link Great trees idea. Water, Great you. idea. And, and finally, yes. Very good. So uh, l l let's g go first to your question. How do you hold <laughs> well, I've got the investment, the immediate, benefits. the immediate benefits, the short term, giving yes. people a sense that something they're doing right now is going to do something right now. Yes, I'll just agree with you. I mean, you know, we're, we're always experimenting with messaging. We're always experimenting with what gets through. And so, yes, I totally agree with you, and we'll have a go. And the role of the investor and, and, and the potential for them to... To, to bring this through into the, into the company? Role of the investors, absolutely. Role of um, shareholders need to wake up to it's not just profit, it, that, what, you know, that we can't just work with money in the way that we have done. Um, yes, as investors, as shareholders, um, we need to start demanding real, genuine action that is not just getting the money back. And I'd go further to say foundations. You know, we're, we're running out of time so much now. We need foundations who are much more bold, much more risky. You know, Tree Sisters, we've had such a time getting funding because we're holistic, because we're multifaceted. And we don't just sit in one pot, we sit in multiple pots. And so the need is to think, okay, um, those institutions that have money, what is the most we can do in the next five years? Not just these 25 year plans. If we're gonna flip something, we need to start really thinking about a very short timeline and how much risk are we willing to take and how much action are we willing to take? And your question, which was, I applied the link, yeah, between, yeah, isn't yeah, that a great it's idea? Brilliant. Yeah, terrific, terrific. And I love it because water and trees coexist, so it's in perfect the matching. I mean, the core. Sorry? The government. I mean, how, how far in could you get the blessing from the government for tax incentives? I don't know, but it's not my area. Yeah. Um, <coughs> and it may be the area of somebody else in this room. Um, you know, the work of Tree Sisters is grassroots. This is. This is public mobilization. This is behavior change from the bottom up. Top down hasn't worked. So, th so my aim is bottom up to see if I can help the humanity and people switch back on again. And I should say that, that if um, you're planting trees in this country on any scale, every single tree is paid for. The actual tree is paid for by the European Union. I'm not sure I've heard that anywhere on the trail, but never mind. Um, and, and, and that is government in a sense, because the British have contributed to that. Um, so there is, is a role for, yeah. Yeah, no, I just want to, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So first off, every tree matters. Every tree, every single tree makes a difference. With your organization, which I love, and I use your products, by the way, um, and my goddaughter is one of your, whatever you call them. She's probably your youngest that you have. Um, you represent a huge, huge network of education, of mobilization, you know, not just the women that sell your products, but the women that receive your products, could be invited into a climate change campaign that they can take action inside of. Yeah. Beyond just seeding a tree in every product, which I would love to follow you around until you do it, um, the impact that we have when we work with an organization that is willing to do that is we, op we, we have access to your entire ecosystem, which is your suppliers, as well as your distributors, as well as your customers. And then if that organization decides that you want to affect major change, then you, you, know, you can have your own goals and you can invite people into it. <coughs> you know, the cost of a tree for us, which is for corporates, it's going to be somewhere between 
33 and 40 pence. We've got to figure it out because it costs us to work with and build the campaigns and I would want to campaign with you. Um, and we can't have our donors who are giving to the trees sorting out our corporate campaign. So we've got to figure that out. We're right in the process of that. Um, but it's cheap. It's cheap. It's cheap in comparison to what we're facing. And, and actually, if your distributor, I don't know what you call them, the ladies that sell your products, boy, are your ambassadors, you know, understood that the work that they're doing is contributing to their children's future. It's, it creates a whole other pride. And then, of course, those people that are actually wanting to buy products that are contributing to their children's future creates a different level of loyalty and an awakening. So think of Tree Sisters as a key that turns and it opens a door to a whole other world of climate change support for women around the world and men, actually, who don't know how to make a difference. But we can help them because, damn, of the consciousness shift work that we do that is so unique that I haven't talked about at all. But just read it from this body, OK? It's in here. <laughs> Because there, we've got solutions, really intelligent solutions that matter. And they, they are at the level of emotional technology, which is the thing that is actually needed to underpin the behavior change. Well, I think you have opened a door, which is to use your phrase. And I think people are very intrigued by what you have to say. And I'm sure it may lead to a certain amount of action. Let us hope it does. Uh, but in the meantime, it really is time for lunch. And for me to say very, very, very many thanks to oh, Claire thanks Dubois you, for uh, talking to us, uh, lighting us up. And um, we'll see what we do. But thank you very much. Very sweet. <laughs>